Dr. Barbara Blackburn is the author of 30 books on rigor, motivation, student learning, and leadership, such as Rigor is Not a Four-Letter Word, Rigor in the English Language Arts and Social Studies Classroom, Rigor in the Math Science Classroom, Money for Good Grades and Other Myths About Motivating Your Child, and Seven Strategies for School Improvement. She is a top 30 global guru in education, an international speaker who presents online and in person, and she has over 30 years in education. I would like to warmly welcome Dr. Blackburn to our specialist series today. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me here, and please call me Barbara. When oh. people call me Dr. Blackburn, I turn around and look for my dad, so I'm <laughs> definitely Barbara. Barbara, it is. Barbara, thank you so much. So first of all, I always like to start off with a little bit of a backstory. So first of all, what led you into education and how did your interest become focused on rigor in curriculum development? Well, um, in terms of how I became, first of all, a teacher uh, and then later a consultant and a university professor, I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, in fact, my parents have proof uh, they have a picture of me. I'm probably eight years old, and I am standing at a chalkboard, apparently trying to teach our kittens how to read. Um, and so I've just always known I wanted to be a teacher. I, I grew up in an education household. My mom was a school secretary, and my dad was a teacher and then a coach and then a university professor. So for me, education was just natural in terms of what I was going to do. Um, I uh, triple majored in college so that I ended up being certified to teach everything from pre-kindergarten -pre up through uh, year nine, uh, not all the way through high school, but up, up through ninth grade, and uh, just immediately wanted to start teaching. And when I graduated, there was a surplus of teachers, not a shortage. So you sort of took the jobs you could get. So I did a little while in a fourth grade working for uh, with remedial students. I did a little while in a sixth grade self-contained teaching math and science and social studies and health and physical education, uh, most of which were not my areas of expertise. <laughs> then I did a little bit more in an, in an elementary school. And then I ended up in what was at the time a junior high, uh, grade seven through nine. Um, and I, I sort of fell into it, but I really liked it. Uh, it was just very different. And after my first year, my principal asked me to work with a group of very special students. And I thought I was getting this big honor that nobody else was getting. And it turned out he needed me to teach the remedial students because nobody else wanted to do it. And um, the thing was, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Those kids they needed someone who wanted to be with them, who didn't think they were being stuck by having to teach them. And I thought it was an honor. So I was just all excited. <laughs> and they also were reading far below grade level. And I, at my heart, had an elementary background. So I knew how to do that. Um, and I think that, I don't think I realized it at the time, but when I look back, that's probably the start of where I really began to think about and do things that were rigorous. Because very quickly, what I realized was that these kids had been in classes where things were dumbed down for them. Um, and I'm teaching them in a pullout setting, so they're not uh, embedded in other classes, but they weren't expected to do very much. And when I expected them to do more, they did more. And so when I look back, I go, wow, okay, that's where it all started. Um, I also, during that time, began to teach uh, the school newspaper. And so I had mainly gifted students, uh, but I also had, had some other students, but it was mainly gifted students. And in some ways, I saw the same thing. Uh, they were used to being challenged creatively, but not in terms of actual academic difficulty level. So when I would ask them to really rise to something challenging, they just wanted to know how they could make it look. Um, and so I think when those things sort of came together, I, it just was part of who I was. Um, when I, I went into educational consulting, I worked with three different publishing companies, and then I worked on my doctorate and taught at the university level. 
And that's when it very much came into focus. Uh, I taught at three different universities and I mainly taught graduate students. So teachers coming back to get an advanced degree. And in one of my classes in particular, we were studying the concept of rigor. And one of my teachers said, we don't need to study this. Somebody just needs to take your class, Dr. Blackburn. That's how it is. Uh, because rigor was what I expected. I had very high expectations. Uh, the very first course I always taught for students coming in to get their master's degree, I used a syllabus I taught when I was teaching a doctoral level course, and I just didn't see any reason to lower it. <laughs> they were able to do it with the right support. And so that's probably when I became just really passionate about it, started doing focus groups and interviews and surveys and writing about it and talking to people about it and presenting about it. And uh, that's sort of where it kicked off. And then that has just um, become more and more true. It's ironic because I had one class that I was teaching for um, just a university. I, I just did a very brief piece with them, but they had one class they specifically asked me to teach. And they said, it's because you are rigorous and we want the teachers in that class to, uh, to really be exposed to that level of rigor. And it's the worst student evaluations I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> they just totally, uh, oh my goodness, they were so bad. And uh, my husband got really upset about them because he was like, you know, you need to tell somebody what happened because one of the things that had happened, I used a very brief activity with them the first week that I use in my workshops. And they thought it was too much work. They wanted a one week extension. So they wanted two weeks to do it instead of one. And this is an activity I do in my workshops that takes 20 minutes. And so they may have said they wanted rigor, but they did not want rigor. And so that's been my one, I guess, negative experience. Of, although I really did just find it humorous at the time. I mean, I was just like, how are we going to hold students to high levels of expectations? if we can't even hold ourselves to it. And so, you know, I guess that's the long way around to saying I absolutely adore rigor. And 99.9% uh, .9 of the time I have really positive experiences with it, except that one time. And I learned things even from that. Yeah. Well, I mean, every day is a school day, right? You, you, you <laughs> never know where you're going to find a lesson. And even in the, uh, the experience that might not be the best. Yeah, there's always mm -hmm. something, right? Mm -hmm. So how would you define rigor and what does rigor look and feel like for a student in a classroom? Uh, rigor is not hard. It is not double the problems. OK, it's, there's a whole lot of things it's not. Um, and I know you're going to give them my website later. There's articles on there about myths. So if you want more about this, you can absolutely get them there. When I talk about rigor, I talk about creating a classroom environment in which students are expected to learn at high levels, students are supported so they can learn at high levels, and they demonstrate learning at high levels. So the first part that's foundational is expectations. If we don't expect high levels of work, we're not going to get it. Um, you know, what I found is that if we tell students they don't, we don't think they can do something, they'll prove us right. But if we tell them, hey, I really believe you can do this. If you need help, I'll be here to help you. They will thrive and they will do things that we would not have expected. So that second part of support has to be paired with high expectations. The higher the level of expectations, the higher the need for support. And I really got pushed back on that one day from a teacher. And, uh, you know, he said to me, he said, you know what? I just, students ought to be able to do it. And if they can't, they shouldn't be in my class. Um, you know, they can go take a class that's not as rigorous. And I asked him, I said, do you remember when you were a first year teacher? Very, very, very first teaching job. And he's like, yeah. I said, good, bad, medium, up and down. And he's like, well, up and down. And I said, did you ever need any help? And he was like, well, yeah, I, I, other teachers helped me. I said, so you were in a rigorous situation and you needed support as an adult. And if you need that, why would you think our students don't? And so, you know, you can't do one without the other. You really do. And you're not doing it for them, but you are supporting them. And then the last part is that students need to demonstrate understanding uh, in a rigorous way. So, for example, let's say that um, 
same in a social studies class. And we've been looking at current events. And what I'm going to do is I could just have them choose a current event, write up a summary, present it in a PowerPoint, you know, whatever. Fine. That's not rigorous. Okay, You're writing a summary. I don't care if you do it in a PowerPoint. You're writing a summary. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to, and you can do it individually, partners or groups, I'm going to have you choose a current event, research it, write your summaries if you need to, but identify both sides of the issue or multiple sides of the issue. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each point of view? And then develop a campaign, whether it's an ad or a PowerPoint or a video, whatever you want to do, that proposes the solution to that issue and specifically addresses all points of view. And that is such a different level of what you are expecting. Um, you know, are you summarizing? Yes, but you are only summarizing to get to this next point. You aren't just sharing your point of view. You are having to address all points of view. And, and that is totally, totally different from what we typically do. Even in a debate, we will debate, well, okay, are you addressing the other side? Yes. All right, what are you going to do to come up with a solution that would actually get both sides on board? Again, takes it to a level that you might not be expecting. Does that make sense? Right, for sure. Yeah. So right. it has has more than one layer. It's multidimensional. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a math one. OK, um, this one was from a fifth grade. This is a little bit easier, but uh, they were looking at volume. So it's actually a STEM activity, math and science. And they had to figure out how much cereal would fit into a cereal box without measuring the box, okay? Now, you're going, oh, wow, that's a lot of hard work. Huh, that's, I'm gonna go in a different direction. Three responses have been provided below. You must decide which one makes more sense. Explain which one makes more sense and why you think it does and then justify your answer by addressing why the other two did not make sense. Now, do you have to be able to figure that question out? Yes, but that's a step getting to the end result of having to really analyze and justify thinking, which is very, very, very different. <laughs> and, and we think about you know, I get this in math a lot of times. Okay, we're doing rote computation. All right, I need to be more rigorous. I give them word problems. Great. And then they say, oh, but I'm really rigorous. I have them write their own word problems. Well, fine and dandy. Two plus two equals four. That's basic rote computation. Uh, Sally has two dogs and Joshua has two cats. How many do they have total? I don't care that it's a word problem. Still rote. Uh, now they're going to write their own word problems, okay? Lee has four pieces of pizza and Barbara has two pieces of pizza. How many pieces do they have to? You may have written the problem, but it's still rote learning. None of those are rigorous. And yet we make the uh, assumption that word problems are rigorous. And the one I just gave you was they aren't even actually solving the problem. They have to figure it out, but then they've got to, based on what they figured out, they've got to choose a solution and justify why it is right and why the others are not very different level of analysis. And that kind of connects to what we do in the IMYC, the International Middle Years Curriculum, which we've started to introduce more of uh, model eliciting activities where it's similar to what you have and, and trying to figure out where there's a sense of rigor of trying to uh, use all different skills and different layers to mm -hmm. get to a viable solution. Yeah, so. Yeah, and the other one that I always think about with math is uh, people talk about we're going to make a model. Okay. And so um, I'm trying to think. Uh, a teacher was talking to me as a ninth grade teacher. He said he had his kids make a model of Pascal's triangle. And what it was was they had to use Pascal's triangle. They could make a lamp. They could make anything they wanted to make. They just had to demonstrate it. Well, that's fine. And that's cute. And it's an engaging activity, and it's one I would probably use in my classroom, but it isn't rigorous. And so what he said to me was, but you have said that rigor is making a model. 
And I'm like, yeah, I, I have said that to you, that rigor is making a model. And he said, but they made a model. I said, yeah, but it's a different kind of model. So here's the kind of model when you talk about rigor. Uh, let's assume that Pythagoras was never born. The Pythagorean theorem provides solutions in a lot of different ways in math. Research that. Now, since he was never born, come up with a different way to address the things that the Pythagorean addresses. And see, they've got to come up with a model there. Totally different. Totally different. Yeah, that's that's great. That's that's just really high level thinking. And, and yes. uh, this is what we're, we're looking for, that definitely in the rigorous classroom. Now, I've heard you say that each student, student should learn at high levels. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean by this? And can you share with us an example of what those high levels look like? Because it could be misinterpreted. Well, and all of the ones I just shared are high levels. OK, so yeah. I got ahead of you. <laughs> you <you've> got <laughs> those. I'll give you a couple of others. Um, high levels, you know, there's a lot of models out there. OK, the one that's probably the most famous that's been around the longest is Bloom's taxonomy. And everybody's like, oh, I'm at high levels of Bloom's. I, I like Bloom's OK. I taught with Bloom's, but I, I have a challenge with Bloom's that I struggle with. And that is that even though it may not have been designed that way, we have made it very verb dependent. So I was visiting a school and, and doing walkthroughs with a principal and a teacher caught me in the hall and she said, I really want you to come see my classroom because I'm teaching a very rigorous lesson today. And I was like, OK, she said, I'm at the top level of blooms. We are creating. Great. I was ready to go. Uh, I got in there and they were creating get well cards for a sick classmate. And that's not rigorous. <laughs> creating a high tech technology presentation when all you're doing is providing basic recall information is not rigorous, even though you are creating a high tech presentation. So for me, when we only look at the verbs, then Bloom's becomes uh, very much a, a challenge to use. So I, I don't prefer that. Um, a lot of people use Webb's depth of knowledge, um, and I really like that. Um, he focuses more on depth in terms of the level of challenge, and I appreciate that. Now, one caution I would give you is that if you Google Webb's depth of knowledge, this great circle comes up that's divided into four, and it's got verbs. Well, that's the same problem as Bloom's. Don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't get that. Actually, I uh, talked with Dr. Webb because I was going to put it in one of my books, and I got a very quick response. Dr. Webb didn't create it. He doesn't endorse it. It doesn't reflect his work. Don't do the circle diagram, okay? And if you are, just use it as a base and move on. Um, and then there's uh, the cognitive rigor matrix, which blends the two. Um, Rick Warmly has levels of challenge. What I did was I, I basically blended all those together and, and created my own rigor check. And so when I am training with teachers and leaders, then I provide that to them and, and we look at things like what makes a rigorous task, like the math one that we, not the Pythagorean theorem, but the uh, one about volume. Here's why that's rigorous. One of the criteria for level three, which is rigor, is to be able to identify and explain misconceptions. And that's what that was. You had the three answers about volume and you had to identify which one was wrong, explain why it was wrong, <laughs> find out which one was right, and then explain why it was right. And so that, that misconceptions piece is real critical. Uh, another one for uh, a level three is that you demonstrate that you <clears throat> understand the text while also going beyond the text. So maybe I have a um, high level, um, High-level text I'm reading. I, mean, I, I tell you what, I'm going to do this one because I really like it. Um, Malala's Nobel Peace Prize. Okay, It's a great one to do in an English social studies classroom. So you start by reading her acceptance speech. speech analyze statistic decisions, consider purpose, syntax, da 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 How do these decisions impact the overall tone and delivery of the speech? Okay, that's good. You're really getting into some English skills, but that's not going to be the heart of the assignment. Now, Read the article, in Pakistan, a self-styled teacher holds class for 150 in a cow shed. How are the dreams of, and aspirations of Malala justified 
after reading about the reality of girls' education in Pakistan. How does that impact what is happening in our society today? So I have to really show you I understand what went on, mm -hmm. but now I've got to be able to take it out and make it practical for me. And that is just totally, totally different. Another one, uh, one of my favorites, and, and these are all in the content books that, that you mentioned at the beginning, um, is you hold a dinner party. And so you have famous people there. Maybe it's uh, Thomas Edison and Marie Curie, and you know, you've got other uh, Tesla. And you have to actually craft the dialogue back and forth where they are debating about who has the most important in invention and why. And then you have to step in and be able to do a reflection about how each of those inventions impacts our life today and what would happen if it had not been invented. So you see how it's just, it, it's a whole different level of, of what you're doing. And they are things students can do. Students want to do those things. Now, do I maybe have a student who can't write a long essay about it? Sure, I might have a student who can't do that. But can they narrate it and record it so that we still get the content? And that's the question. Do I care about the content or do I care about it looking the way I want it to look? And do I care about it's three paragraphs, five sentences each paragraph, or do I care that they covered the information? Mm -hmm. And all of those are very different things when you think about rigor. That's really great. And you gave us some great um, examples there for the mathematics classroom and some other uh, um, subjects as well. Are there any other key strategies you would say for something like in the, in the mathematics classroom for teachers to consider? Um, you know, I, I think focusing on open ended is really important. Uh, the more you're doing the closed ended, the, the tougher it is to get up to those higher levels. Yeah. Um, I do think as much as possible, have them take whatever you're doing and put it into a new setting you know, make that real life application. So whether it's real life or they link it to another subject area, or maybe they link it to another area, we're doing algebra and they link it to geometry, but trying to pull it out and make those connections. And it's particularly strong if you can give them a variety of things and they have to figure out how to connect them and they don't look like they're connected to start with. Um, and I think those are really, really positive. And, and I would do that even just as a short, not necessarily a woohoo rigorous activity, but uh, just as a one to, to start uh, a lesson with, uh, let's say we're starting a new chapter. Okay? And I'm not even gonna begin to try to do the content because I love math, but I'm not a math expert. So I'm not gonna try to do this, but let's say that I'm getting ready to start a chapter on whatever. And there are, um, eight concepts in there that we're going to be looking at. Then what I'm going to do is give students cards with those concepts on them, or I'm going to put them up on the screen, whatever you want to do. And with a partner, small group, whatever, they have to figure out how to categorize those. And they have to be able to explain why they use the categories they did. And then I use that as a springboard for the discussion as we go into the chapter. And then at the end of the chapter, I have them come back and do it again and see if they do it differently. And that's really small, but it's a good way to bookend a lesson. Mm. Those are great, great ideas, great strategies, uh, Barbara. And with that, I'm sure when people um, go through rigor and they look at it in their classroom, I'm sure there are lots of myths out there. Can you tell us one myth that you would like to debunk yes, about yes. rigor in education? Uh, oh, I only got to pick one. Or you can Maybe. pick more than one. My, but, well, you know. uh, and again, there's articles on this up on the website. So, you know, they go grab them. Honestly, if I only had to pick one, I would get rid of the myth that rigor is not for everyone. Because too often we believe it's only for certain students, whether it's only for gifted, only for advanced, only for students who want to be here, only for students who have parents who are willing to push them. Take your pick. That is not true. Rigor is for everyone. You just got to have the right people willing to help them get there. Um, and it really does. That one probably more than anything bothers me. And, and I have seen it with, uh, I, was, I was working with a gifted teacher and she said uh, she was really struggling with one of her students. And she said, you know, the thing is, 
because she's gifted in English, she's got to be in the gifted program. But her math teacher tells me there is no way she's gifted in math. Now, you may feel that way about a student, but let me tell you, that means you've just written that student off. Mm -hmm. And it, your choice is to feel that way or to say, you know what, they may not be as gifted as some other students, but they're gifted in different ways. How can I help them tap into that? And, and that is very much a belief that that is a choice that you make as a teacher or as a principal. And, you know, I, I certainly did my share of having students that had a reputation and I wrote them off. OK, I made a huge mistake one time with a student with that, but I also learned from it. And and I do believe that every single student can thrive if we help them do it. And it, they may thrive in different ways. But honest to goodness, I got into teaching to help take kids from where they are to a new level of learning. And that really and truly is what rigor is. And if that's not what you're doing, then rigor is not for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's a it's a I think an important myth to debunk because I think that is very much um, placed into a, you know, for the higher level or the, you know, the advanced learners. but. Mm -hmm. You know, to consider that it should be across the board. I, I you know, for for everyone, it's a it's a very good one to uh, to really think about. So, in our international middle years curriculum, the IMYC, we have something called the process of learning or the process to facilitate learning. This process is repeated many times throughout an academic year, providing familiarity and routine to a student's learning journey. So, how could teachers increase rigor throughout this process? particularly with ongoing assessments and uh, the end of a unit, such as the exit point that we have. Yeah, uh, and I mean, you can do all the testing you want. I'm not even going to go to testing. We, we're good at testing. You don't need me to talk about testing. Right. Um, I'm going to give you some real simple ones, okay? So something like your knowledge harvesting. Okay? I really like an activity called write the room. And what you do is before you do anything, you write some phrases or words up on poster paper that's around the room. And uh, students just go around the room and write anything they know related to that word, just whatever it is. And then again, the teacher can use that as a part of the lesson. And then uh, for somebody, let's say I had somebody who was sick that day and they come in and immediately it's like, what did I miss? Well, I want you to read the room. Yeah, go, go around and read the room. That's what you miss. And so I love write the room, read the room, uh, because you, you do some some knowledge harvesting with that. Uh, another one I like, um, again, these are just, they're not necessarily as rigorous. They just sort of tweak it a little bit. Um, rather than telling students today, we're going to learn about shapes. You know, we're going to learn about square circles and triangles. Okay, boring. Kids' minds do not come on. They do with a question, but they don't. And honest to goodness, I don't know what we accomplish when we do that. So what I'm going to do is do a game called Three Alike. And in Three Alike, I'm going to give you three of something, and you have to tell me how they are alike. Okay? So I'm going to give you Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Pfizer. What do they have? What, how are they alike? They're all vaccinations. They're all vaccinations. <laughs> okay. And or so something. the thing is, instead of just telling you, I'm asking you. So I find out who has prior knowledge and who doesn't. And I'm also asking you a question which turns your brain on. So I like a step up from that. Okay, this one's called the red herring game. You know, red herring in a detective novel takes you off track. Okay, so in this one, I'm going to give you four. You have to tell me which one doesn't belong and why. So we're going to keep it fairly simple for, example, for the example purposes. We're going to still go with uh, AstraZeneca, uh, Moderna, uh, Zoomology, and Pfizer. Which one doesn't belong and why? Zoomology, because that's not a company that creates a vaccination. Right. That okay. I know. So, <laughs> <laughs> now, what will happen when you do this with students is, one, you're not just making something up out of the blue. You're using right. things you're teaching. And students tend to have a really hard time with it sometimes uh, because, you know, maybe what you're headed toward is uh, a country that doesn't have a coastline. And they're coming up with, oh, that one had eight letters instead of seven. <laughs> you know, you have to be careful when you're planning it. But that's going to let me sort of get at 
some background knowledge. The learning activities, you know, I'm going to, I, my bias is I'm going to do a lot of group work, um, not all, and I'm always going to have individual accountability, but I think they learn talking to each other. I'm going to make sure that when they are working together, that we are not uh, just talking. We are actually using academic discourse, which is very different. Academic discourse uses academic vocabulary. It is on focus, on target. They're not talking about last night's game or who's doing what. You know, they're not doing all that. And you are really using very focused questioning. And instructionally, I may, if I feel like they're asking questions that are too basic or they're not asking questions that are on target, I will give them some question starters. Uh, I'm not going to give them the whole question, but I might give them starters like, why might? How would? Who might? So I'm going to give them some questions that, that focus their efforts. I'm also going to give them some reflective questions. And, you know, what, what students will tell you is that it is harder to ask questions than to answer them because you really have to understand your com content. So mm -hmm. from an instructional standpoint, I am really, really going to do that. I'm going to uh, build in lots of activity. I mean, we could talk for three days about instructional activities, but that's just an example. Uh, reflection, I always want them to reflect. We are pretty good at using exit slips. What did I learn? Uh, what do I still want to know? Okay, exit slips are fine. I don't have a problem with them. They're fine and dandy. But sometimes all we do is ask them what they learned. And what I want to know is how they learned and how much they think they learned. So, you know, what did you learn? Uh, how did you learn that? Just that basic a question. Or you can do something with a checkoff. Did you learn that by watching the video, by doing the computer game, you know, by working with your friends? You know, how did you learn that? Because that begins to tell me what is connecting for them. And then I want them to do the whole metacognitive assessing their own uh, knowledge. And there are so many ways out there to do that, but pretty much all of them are the same way. I really have it down, um, feeling pretty good, struggling, I am lost. And you'll have people who do rockets <laughs> or two stars or do colors or do stop likes. I mean, you know, good grief, there's tons of it out there. But I want to know where they think they are, because I want to make sure that matches with what I think. Mm -hmm. Because if I think they didn't get it and they think they did, we got to make sure I got to watch that. Because that means either that I'm assessing it wrong or that they're assessing it wrong and I need to coach them into, into understanding. Because one of the things we know is this. It's really interesting because there's actually research on this. People who don't understand something, people who don't know, don't know they don't know. And you may have been behind a car with a driver, and that was true, okay? I certainly have. They did not know that they did not know that they were driving in the wrong lane, okay? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it drives you crazy. But they don't know they don't know. So I need to sort of figure out if that's a pattern. And that's for all students. People start going, oh, those are just struggling students. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Sometimes your very top students, will say they don't know when they actually do, but because they're perfectionists, then anything less than perfection means they don't know. So you've got to work with that. So I'm going to look at those kinds of things too. And then that's going to be part of my exit point, uh, just figuring out then with the exit point, where do I go next? Those are fantastic ideas, strategies, and takeaways. Mm -hmm. And you know we're coming to an, uh, close to our our um, our interview here, but um, is there any other takeaway that you would like the listeners and viewers to know about with your research and discoveries in the field of education? And this can be with rigor. Um, <laughs> you have given us so many takeaways already, but is there anything oh, else you'd like us to know as a, as a closing? Such a hard question. You know, there's probably 50, okay? And so I'm not going to do any of those. I am going to take this minute to tell your teachers something that I think they need to hear. Okay? I find over and over again that teachers are not appreciated. They have really hard jobs. They are doing the best they can. And some days they still don't feel like that it's going the way they need to go. Okay. So I want to tell every teacher and every leader who's listening this. On your worst day, 
you are someone's best hope. And I will go further than that. On your worst day, the day you spilt coffee on your shirt and the kids missed the bus and your car broke down and the copier at the school didn't work and two parents were on the phone waiting for you by the time you walked in the door and then every el everything else that could go wrong did. On that worst day, you probably are not somebody's best hope. You probably are someone's only hope. And if you don't remember anything else I say today, please remember that. Wonderful. That was great. Thank you so much for sharing and and giving all this great uh, strategies and all of your experience that you've had in education. So thank you, Barbara, for all your insights. You are welcome. Um, for more information on Dr. Barbara Blackburn's latest work, you can check out www barbarablackburnonline.com, where you'll find an array of articles, free activity templates from books, podcasts, and over 100 free resources for educators. I'd like to thank you again. Really appreciate your time and your all your wonderful stories and insight and uh, hope to see you again. Absolutely. Thank you very much. <music>